Reactive power is one of those concepts that scares people, but it doesn't have to. Conceptually, it's quite simple, and it starts by understanding the three passive components. They are the resistor, the capacitor, and the inductor. When you consider these components, realize that one of them is very different than the other two. And you may have guessed it, it's the resistor. When you put a resistor in circuit, the only thing it does is it gives off heat. You see, a resistor takes the electrical energy and converts it into heat energy. Capacitors and inductors, on the other hand, store energy. In fact, if we were to take an ideal capacitor or an ideal inductor, there would be no heat associated with these components whatsoever. For a capacitor, the amount of energy stored is equal to one half capacitance times the voltage squared. For an inductor, the amount of energy stored is equal to one half the inductance times the current squared. Capacitors store electrical energy by converting it into an electrostatic field, whereas inductors store electrical energy in an electromagnetic field. For the remainder of the video, I'm going to focus on the inductor. In particular, this equation. If you think about it, and you think about the conservation of energy, and you think about how energy flows from one system to another, you can see that time is implicit into this equation. You see, the amount of energy stored in an inductor or any other device must have time to accumulate. Let's draw a circuit and explore what this means. Let's start with a battery. And there's going to be a certain amount of resistance associated with that battery. Unfortunately, it's unavoidable. We'll add a switch. We'll add what's called an amp meter. And finally, we'll add the inductor itself. Now, if we were to plot the current in the inductor as a function of time, it would look something like this. At time zero, we close the switch. That puts us right here on our graph. We're assuming the inductor was initially uncharged. And as time marches along, the current in that inductor will increase. How did we know the current increased? Well, we know that back up here, because of this equation, that we can't have an instantaneous change in energy. Therefore, the current must also be slow to rise. In the circuit we've drawn, you will find that the current will limit itself. In fact, you could calculate that using Ohm's law if you wanted. You could say that the current is equal to the voltage on the battery divided by the resistance. This is the voltage on the battery, and this is the resistance. So now, let's do something interesting. Let's take the battery and instantaneously flip its polarity. So now we've got the positive terminal of the battery connected this way. We can now plot this. So at this particular moment in time, we flip the battery. Again, we flipped it instantaneously. And this will be the result. You'll notice that the current is the same magnitude but opposite polarity. However, if we look at the energy equation up here, we'll see that current is squared. So in both cases, the amount of energy that's stored is the same. Now here's something you might not have noticed. When we had the battery in the original circuit, energy was stored in the inductor. When we reversed the battery, there is a moment in time right here. So let's highlight that in red. There's a moment in time right here where the current went to zero. In fact, we could say that if the current is zero, the energy is zero. So the inductor charged, it absorbed energy, and then the inductor returned the energy back to the circuit. And then as time continued on, the inductor once again charged, this time with a different polarity, but still charged nonetheless. And then if we were to flip the battery again, 
we would see a waveform like this, and once again, the current would go to zero. So to summarize, from here to here, the inductor was charging. From here to here, the inductor returned its energy. From here to here, the inductor was again charging, and then it returned the energy once again. There's one last step, and you might already know where I'm going with this. We're going to replace the battery with an alternating current voltage source. And when we do that, we're going to have this as the voltage being fed to our circuit. So we'll identify that with a V for voltage. From this equation up here, we know that current will be delayed. How far delayed? Well, we'll talk about it in another video, but it's 90 degrees. So the current waveform would look like this with a 90 degree delay behind the voltage. So there, voltage and then current, like so. Did you see what happens to the current? Do you see what's happening here? Let's go back up to our energy equation. Watch what the current does. So from here to here, energy is being stored. From here to here, energy is being returned back to the source. From here to here, energy is being absorbed, to be sure with the opposite polarity, but absorbed nonetheless. And from here to here, it's being returned. And that, my friends, is reactive power. You'll notice that that energy, that, that flow, hasn't done any work. There's no heat given off by the inductor. It hasn't done any physical work, it hasn't moved anything, it hasn't made any noise, it just sat there. That's what reactive power is. Now you might say, well fine, okay, the power is imaginary, it doesn't matter. By the way, imaginary is a hint back to the trigonometry we'll use to describe this in later videos. Um, but you might say it's an imaginary thing. It doesn't do any useful work, it's not needed. We can ignore it. That is definitely not true. Because while it didn't do any useful work, there was, once again, back to our equation up top here, there was a current flow. You had to provide the inductor with current. Okay, so it's, it's a very real imaginary thing. <laughs> and it'll make a little more sense in the follow-up videos. But for now, let's just say this. The most common electrical load you're going to find is a motor. You could think of a motor as a little bit of resistance and a fair amount of inductance. Okay. So this is a motor, one of the most common loads that you're going to find on our power system. That motor is typically connected up to an alternating current source. You can see there will be some real power flow. For example, the resistor will give off heat, and also on the motor there will be an output shaft which will be turning and hopefully doing some real work for us as well. But we can't forget this inductor. So when we're connected up to an AC power supply, there will always be some reactive power flowing where energy is stored on that inductor. Then the energy is returned to the circuit. Then more energy is stored on the inductor although in the opposite polarity, and then return once again back to the power supply. In follow-up videos, we'll be more sophisticated. We'll develop a language that allows us to describe real power and reactive power. It allows us to describe the real component that does useful work, or it gets burned up in heat, and how that's different from the reactive power, this imaginary power that sloshes back and forth between the inductors in our circuits and the power